Hey, so we yeah. were talking out by uh, when we were having coffee this morning <clears throat> about uh, the sports you played as a kid. I yeah. didn't know you you boxed, huh? Yeah, yeah. I did some boxing. Um, I did track and field. Um, I did a bunch of stuff, but yeah, boxing. I I went to the Catskills and trained with Kevin Rooney. Oh wow! Uh, that's Mike Tyson's uh-huh. former trainer. So I learned how to throw some throw some bombs and learn how to dodge some punches and stuff. Uh, mainly, probably the first five six months that I was there, he didn't even really show me how to throw a punch. And I was like, man, this is <laughs> this is a drag. This is pretty boring. You know? <laughs> like all like, footwork. Yeah, it was all footwork oh, and all man. just uh, head movement. The way you saw like Mike Tyson. Not, obviously, I wasn't able to mimic what Mike Tyson was able to do, <laughs> but a lot of that, you know. Um, just kind of like windshield wiper back and forth, just head movement mm. constantly was uh, what they reinforced there. Do you have a lot of amateur matches? <clears throat> no, no. And it, I think a lot of that has to do, a lot of that had to do with the fact that just I was a big kid. And whenever I went to into somebody else's camp or whenever we went to uh, another person's gym, there just wasn't people uh, in my weight class. So I'd still box them, but it was like more like sparring because I was... Uh, I've been over 200 pounds probably since I was about 13. Oh, wow. And at that time, I was probably 15, 16, between 220, 240. What the fuck were you doing in track? Was it shot put? Yeah, I was trying to get away with just throwing Jabble the shot put. Okay, I was going to say, you ain't uh, running. And just throwing the discus, <laughs> but uh, my track coach wasn't having it. The, the first day, she's like... Uh, you know, no one on this track team is just gonna throw throw stuff. Oh, you gotta you gotta run as well. And I was like, oh my god, <laughs> oh, no. I'm a fat kid. I'm just like trembling in my shoes, you know. Yeah. So I, I had to run, and I I did hundred meter. Oh no, nope, uh, no way. Four by one hundred meter. Yeah, I could actually run back in the day. Now I, you know, if I tried to run, I don't think I could stop. You gotta do the hardest part. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> That'd be the worst. <laughs> like part. Juggernaut. Or I might just blow something out. You know, yeah. blow out a hammy or yeah. something. For, legit. When's the last time you've run? I can, cause I can, I can identify. Well, he run, he runs bit. on the treadmill. Yeah, 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 I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll run here and there. He's not like you. Sal's allergic to running now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't even Breaks actually know. In hives. I don't even know if Sal knows how to turn on the treadmill. No, <laughs> yeah, I'm no. pretty sure he doesn't. <laughs> not, not at all. <laughs> uh, an actual sprint. We had a, a speed golfer on our podcast uh, not too long ago. What's a speed golfer? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> is <laughs> That's that, what is I'm that saying. A real thing. Hey, listen, he's a world record holder. Okay. All right. <laughs> in speed in, golf how does what, that how does that work guinness book of world yeah. records or what that's what my wife said the same thing my wife's like come on you could be a world record holder in anything right? yeah yeah like exactly. you make you make up something and you could be a world record in it right so they have to run from hole to hole yeah you got to sprint from hole to hole apparently it's hard no, golf c- seems to be difficult enough as it is I it know. sounds way more fun you know running honest. in between yeah no carts is that the idea uh yeah no carts and uh you got people trying to tackle you Shut. No, I, I, made, that, I made that. Part. I was gonna say. I made that part. Oh, man. Maybe like, we could start our own. Exciting. Start. <laughs> I'm start, down. Start our own sport. Yeah, powerlifting golf or something like that. You know, it probably exists in Russia. You got to hit the ball everybody. and then you got to deadlift, double your body weight, and oh. then you got to go to the next one. That wouldn't yeah. be bad. You know what I'm saying? So I'll I, hold the record. On that. I saw you you post something the other day that I thought was really cool, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it because. Um, you know what? Uh, I know that once you, once you reach a, a certain point of success, I think. Uh, one of the things that's probably got to be really difficult for a father is uh, to know how much of that you you give to your kids. And I saw that you bought your son a new truck. Yeah. Um, and actually, what I was most impressed by it was that I know what you you could have bought him. <laughs> right. But you bought him kind of like an old C10, which is a cool truck, by yeah, the way. Yeah. It's a very cool truck to have for for a young man, no matter what. But I know you could buy him a brand new whatever. And you chose to buy a, an old kind of beat up C10. Why is that? My son aspires to be like the exact opposite of me. He uh, despises despises being uh, well off, and you know I, I recognized hmm. maybe a couple of years ago that you know maybe being wealthy is just as embarrassing as being poor. Hmm. And, Interesting. Uh, you know, so like when he's. Hmm. When he's had friends over the house and things like that, they're like, you guys live in a castle, you know? And he, like, I don't know, it's just uh, as a kid, especially as a young boy, I think it doesn't feel great for people just to think that you have no resistance. Because as a teenager, like, you're just, you're flooded with all the same problems as every other teenager, whether you're white, black, or otherwise, or whether you're rich or you're poor. Like, we can all identify being a teenage kid is tough, you know? So... He wants to kind of like identify with like uh, things being a little bit harder. 
Oh, wow. And interesting. So, you know, we bought him, you know, basically a piece of shit, you know, on purpose because he wants to work for it. He wants to like fix it up. He wants to, I mean, he'll wear a cowboy hat. He, we have a, we, my wife and I recently bought a new house. We haven't moved into it just yet, but he goes over there and he's always doing like yard work. He goes over there with my dad and they like mow the lawn and they, you know, weed whack and do all that shit over there. And it's all stuff I would never do in a million years because I just pay people to do it. That's hilarious. So it's like he's, uh, <laughs> wow. well, teenagers rebel. So yeah. it's, his, it's his way. That's I a had, cool way to rebel. I had some clients who were like, hard, this is a long time ago. They were hardcore uh, atheists and their kid <laughs> to rebel became like super religious. Oh, wow. And they were like, what the <laughs> fuck did we do? And I'm like, kids will just do the opposite. of yeah, what, right. you That's know? so interesting because I assume that was kind of you. I thought that was right. you kind of putting that on him. Like, hey, just because dad has all yeah. these things. Yeah, maybe you should have challenged him by getting him like a really nice yeah. expensive <laughs> yeah, car. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, get him a new Tesla or something. Yeah, I thought it was like a Warren Buffett thing like how he is with his kids yeah. he's just like you gotta work for it it is a little bit because my dad my dad is there with him a lot doing you know doing this manual labor type of stuff because my dad always liked doing that stuff uh, my grandfather um, had like a used car lot and he was really good with his hands he built his own home he he built a car he you know rebuilt these cars and sold them and stuff like that and so my dad is very familiar with you know using his hands and that just skipped me. I never, I never wanted to, my dad would show me stuff as a kid. He would like paint the wall and he'd be like, here's how you do this. You know, these kind of like long strokes and, and I would do it and I would like mess it up. And then he'd be like, no, 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 it's more like this. And then like half of the uh, garage would be painted already. And then I would kind of just lose interest, you know, cause I, I probably had some ADHD along with probably a million other problems and I'd be off just throwing around my football or something. And he painted the whole garage. So a lot of that stuff, I just, I would never found really a lot of interest in. My dad was also like a nine to five blue collar, uh, IBM, uh, employee for many, many years. And I always saw that and I was like, whatever the hell that is. I don't, I know I don't want to do that. Like you got to wear a suit and tie every day. Mm. Yeah. And then he took me to work with him one day and like, he was just at his desk and he's like, I don't know. He answered like a couple calls. He like wrote some shit down and then he like took some balls out of his desk and started like juggling them. And I'm like, this seems pretty boring. <laughs> like, obviously that's not what he did every day, but I was like, this seems kind of boring, whatever the hell it is that he does, you know? <laughs> and so uh, I always wanted to be kind of the opposite of him. And now that I'm older and I have a much better understanding of like who he is as a person, there's nobody that I aspire to be more so than my dad. Mm. So that's strange. So you wanted to be the opposite of your dad and your son wants yeah. to be the opposite of you. Yeah, right. So it takes right after you. Now, did yeah. you have any challenge with that? Was there a, was there a moment when he was starting to grow up and you, because I would, I would assume you worked really hard to get to the place that you're at now. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I, if, you know, I have a, a, only a, a 10 week old right now. And I imagine that, and I, and I've busted my ass. I waited a very long time till I even had a child because I wanted to be in a place financially. And so I imagine if he was coming up and, you know, I had nice things, which I would, will have when he's growing up. Uh, if he almost kind of resents me for it, I think I would struggle with that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I don't I don't worry about it too much. I mean, I know what you're talking about, though. Um, I just try to be there for my kids. And, and I think, you know, if I have a weakness, it's maybe that I don't push them enough because it's hard to figure that part out. Like, how hard do I push them on something? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, some parents push their kids so hard on stuff that the parents hate them, but it still ends up being like in the kid's best interest. And the kid still ends up being like a doctor or a lawyer, or at least acquires some form of success that we would all agree upon that looks like success in today's culture. You know, so I, I don't know uh, what that line is. I don't know how hard to push. My son played baseball and he played some other sports for a little while. And when he was playing baseball, we were just like driving to a practice and he was like, you know what? I don't really like baseball. And I was like, oh, I'm like, okay, you don't have to play baseball. He's like, we don't have to go to practice today. I said, no, well, you got to go to practice today and you got to finish out right. the season because you agreed to be on this team and it's kind of part of, uh, you know, part Commit of the way, part commitment, of the way. It right? Yeah, it's part of the commitment of it, you know. So uh, he played out the rest of the year and then he never played baseball again, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it's like, I don't know that line. I don't know if anybody does. No, I think uh, some kids uh, push themselves so hard that, and it, that's why it's a, it's an individual thing. They push themselves so hard that if you add more pressure onto them, it could be a disaster. And then other kids, I think, need it. How do you? How would you define success for your kids? Like if you could, if you could, you know, pick out their futures and and, and consider them successful, what would that look like for you? 
I'll start by saying success for me as a parent is just to not have my kids be an asshole. I just don't want my kids to grow up to be like disrespectful Mm -hmm. of other people. And so far, they've been pretty good with that. They've been handling that pretty good. Uh, Success for them. I hope that they find something that they really enjoy. I hope they find something that uh, excites them. I hope they find something that makes them happy something that makes them feel complete. And that's all I'm really looking for, mm. you know, and hopefully, hopefully by seeing, you know, what my wife do, what my wife and I do on a daily basis, hopefully they kind of get that vibe of that's what my wife and I are working for and working towards. And the reason why we love working so much uh, is the fact that we take great pleasure and we take great pride in it. And mm. so Hopefully they're they're seeing that. I think you know. I think it's having an impact on them. You're such a, dr- a driven person, um, and for me, one of the biggest challenges was figuring out how to balance being an involved father and uh, and work. Uh, I did a terrible job of it early on, and, and I'm learning now how to do a better job of it. How do you how do you balance those things out? Are you very involved with their, in your in your kids' lives? I know you're successful. You got multiple mm-hmm. businesses. What does that look like for you? Yeah, I'm very involved in their lives. I I see, you know, I get to spend time with them every single day. Um, one thing I think maybe people are, um, I don't know, people are trying, I think people are always trying to have like quality time with their kids or quality time with their relationships they have. And uh, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It doesn't have to be anything. You don't have to take them to Disneyland or I think, even taking him to Disneyland, I think, is uh, a little a little bit uh, fake in a way because it's like you spend so much time away from them. Now you're taking them to Disneyland and now you get the picture of you and them and you post about how much you love your family on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's um, that could maybe come off uh, the wrong way. But I'm always there for my I'm there for my kids a lot. And when I'm not there for my kids, I share with them. I, I communicate with them a lot. I talk to them as if they're adults. And I say, I'm not always going to be here for you because I might be working. I might be doing something. And I was like, it would be a disservice to you if I was there all the time. You got to get yourself out of shit sometimes. You got to figure out stuff on your own sometimes. So I think um, the way that we spell love in my family is T-I-M-E. You know, we, we try to spend a lot of time with each other. Sometimes it's, it is quality time. Sometimes it's great Sometimes all of us will go for a walk at the same time. And other times we're just like all in the same house, Mm. but no one's doing anything with each other. Like we're all individually on a phone or something like that. Um, Those are all things that we try to uh, manage as well. Uh, My kids put their phones away at 7 p.m. every night. We all put them on a charger. My wife and I got to shut our shit down too. Uh, because we found that like it wasn't working to say these rules only exist for you, but they don't exist for us. And so we, we try, we try, we really do. We try, we try to make an effort. And um, I'm fortunate in the fact that my kids, they, they love the family aspect of it. They love when we go somewhere as a family. They love when we go to Thanksgiving and um, we're there with their cousins and nephews and or my nieces and nephews and stuff like that. They, they really look forward to it. They talk about it a lot. When we're at the dinner table or if we go out to dinner, um, we're only allowed to have one phone and we just think like one phone just in case some sort of communication. Sometimes my wife and I might go out with my son, Jake, and we might leave my daughter behind. Maybe she's tired from volleyball practice or whatever. And so that's the reason for like the one phone. But we normally phones are away when we're eating phones are away. Like just these, just these small things, um, that have helped us, uh, to be able to spend, better time together and more time together. Mm. Speaking of, uh, of phones and technology, I mean, you grew up um, similar time to us where we grew up without such ease of access to technology and the, the ease of distractibility. Um, and now we live, obviously, and we conduct our business through all this stuff. How do you foresee that challenge uh, if, just from a health perspective? Mm. I mean, you're in the you're in the health and fitness space. I mean, do you see that being the next, we, we predict that being the next big uh, the next big challenge is figuring out how to how to manage digital wellness. Shit. I think uh, people are dying uh, on social media. I think most of the big players in social media are feeling incomplete. They're they're depressed. They have a lot of anxiety. They're not getting out of social media what they originally thought they would get from it. 
And um, I do think that you'll see, you know, more movements of people saying, hey, you know, put your phone away for a day or put your phone away for the week. Like there might be like a week dedicated to it or something like that or a month. I don't know. Um, but it's hard because there's just so much going on on social media all the time. Um, it's hard for people to detach or to get away from social media. But if you go back to the original reason uh, why all of us um, have decided to try to take our own path, it was to have like our own business and to not have to be on the hook for anything. Uh, but as you guys see, it doesn't work that way. I don't really work for myself. I work for every customer that I have. I work for, you know, I do work for social media. I, I work for anything that I have to do work for. Um, I have to produce that amount of work. And as soon as you don't produce that amount of work anymore, then you don't produce that amount of work anymore. And your worth, it's possible that you'll feel that your worth has decreased because you have less likes or less views or less people. And it can be a really, uh, a really horrible trap. You know, I, I feel fortunate that I have, I have an amazing team of people around me. I have an amazing family. And so, you know, just like anybody else, a bad comment or not as many likes doesn't make me feel great, but it also doesn't put me, you know, on a downward trend of really worrying about, you know, man, I bet I better come with something really good to post yeah. tomorrow. You know, well, I better bench 500 again, or otherwise people yeah. aren't going to care. Well, I think about this stuff a lot. I have kids too. My son uh, is 14 years old. How old are your kids? Uh, six or 15 and 12. Yeah. So my, so my boy's 14 years old and, and I, I have these conversations with them because it was so different. I mean, if it, I couldn't imagine having a camera around cause there's cameras all, the, all over the place, right? Cause of phones. Yeah, this I couldn't, well, not just in here, but I mean, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. I couldn't imagine doing some of the stupid shit that I did as a kid. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, you get your ass kicked, it was over. Yeah. That's it. Nobody knows. Now you get your ass kicked. You can be a, vi a video of it. Yeah. All your friends have to watch. Yeah. Next it. thing yeah. you know, you're you know 38 years old. You're at a bar trying to talk to some girl. And they're like, Hey, that's the dude. <laughs> Remember you guys ass kicked at the you know whatever. Yeah. So it's very different. I can also imagine what I would have done with a, a phone with video capacity with my girlfriend when I was 15 years old. Yeah. Some right. Other right. Shit. Do you have these conversations with your kids? And yeah. So my kids aren't supposed to have social media. Whether they have it or not, I don't know. I don't snoop through their phones. I try not to get. I try not to. I try not to helicopter too much. I try my best with that, but as you know, that can be that can be really <laughs> difficult. Um, I have had a lot of conversations with them about a lot of different things. I mean, I mainly would like for them to interact with people in person. That's you know that's the hope. You know whether they follow through on that, um, I'm not really sure. Um, it is all very complicated. It's, it's very hard to make sense of it because like. Well, you developed this business via the internet mm -hmm. and via social media. And then now you're telling me that I can't, you know, I can't have social media. I can't use some of these things. Um, I am very cautious with how much stuff I post of my kids. I was just going to ask you, do you post pictures and stuff? It's, them? Yeah, here and there, here and there. And I ask them, you know, I just flat out ask them like, hey, is it okay to take a picture? And they know like if it's okay to take a picture, that probably means that I'm going to post it somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, but I try to be cautious of that, of that. I mean, even what you just said, like, what about, you know, you're four years old and you come down for Christmas and you open up, you know, open up your presents and stuff and you're crying because you didn't get the thing that you wanted. I mean, we all have these like things that, <laughs> that have happened to us as kids and we don't really want to amplify it. And then there's the parent, you know, showing, oh, Timmy struck out in baseball or mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, and here he is like throwing this fit and they think it's funny. Right. And maybe it is kind of funny, like it's comical to everybody, but at the expense of what, you know? And yeah. so, you know what I'm more worried about is I'm worried less about that kind of stuff and more about, cause you see like, like big celebrities, right? Their kids have huge social media pages mm -hmm. simply because they're the child of, you know, right. whoever. And I feel like when you get that kind of admiration and fame at a young age, that can be very damaging. Oh, you get all this attention. Everybody thinks you're so cool. Right. And you did nothing. I think it'll blow up your ego, blow up your, your you know, how awesome you think you are. And then, you know, one day you're going to realize you're not that cool. <laughs> and that will all come crashing down. That's my big worry. That's why I don't post too yeah. much of them. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I don't know. They see me like with like fans and stuff. And I just don't know uh, where their minds are at with that kind of stuff. I don't know what they... I don't really know how they truly feel about some of that stuff, mm -hmm. whether they uh, want that life or whether they don't want that life at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I, I know that they have a lot of admiration for my dad. My parents live right next door 
and probably the coolest thing that that ever happened you know out of you know building slingshot and building a business was being able to buy a house for my parents that are right next door to us and we get to see them every single day um my kids my kids know that my dad is real you know my dad's a dude that just he just goes to church he's really good to people and as a result, a lot of good things happen to him. He's had a lot of shitty things happen to him from a health perspective, um, but he's always just plowed through him. He's always just kind of kept his head down. So I think I don't know what I don't know what uh, influence I'm having or impact I'm having. I can't really say like that's uh, like to be determined. I'm try try my best, uh, but I know for sure that like I got somebody really good uh, with my mom and dad. You know, being right right next door, they get to see that as an example. And then even further, my wife is uh, one of the few people in the world who's never taken a selfie before. She doesn't even know where to look on the phone <laughs> to even try to take a selfie. So I think my daughter sees that. Like my wife, um, not that there's anything wrong with like sexualizing stuff or, or feeling sexy about yourself, but my wife just, she doesn't go down that road ever, you know? And so my daughter is in like a 3X baggy hoodie that's mine, you know, she's like, that's, she's 12, you know, so who knows when, you know, two years from now, she probably it's been different be wearing, conversation. <laughs> yeah, probably wearing something totally different and she's getting into volleyball. So they got the short shorts going and stuff already, which I'm not too pumped about, but I think she has some good role models around her, I guess mm. is my point. And I, and I hope that my kids are identifying with that. Mm. I'm going to change gears with you a little bit. Uh, did you watch Game Changers? I didn't know. You haven't seen it yet? The, mm. It's the documentary on uh, plant-based. and. Oh, I haven't seen it yet, no. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about the this? Arnold Schwarzenegger thing. Yeah, right? I mean, you've been in the, you've been in the space as long as, uh, as long as I have, or if not longer. Um, I've seen diets come and go, and, and, you know, at one point it was low fat, and then it was low carb, and then it was keto and paleo, and... But this new vegan plant-based push seems a little different to me. Are you are you feeling the same thing? Yeah, you know, I I would just say like I I've never tried a vegan diet, so I because of that I don't know anything about it. You know, um, well they don't eat meat. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I I do understand that side of it. Um, I just think about my own experiences. So like you know, I did powerlifting for a long time. And while doing powerlifting, you know, CrossFit came around and people made fun of CrossFit. And I was like, well, wait a second. Have you ever tried CrossFit? Have you ever been to a CrossFit gym? Have you ever done a CrossFit workout? Do you know a good CrossFit coach? Because maybe CrossFit's not that bad. So I've always been a little bit more open to it. Um, Did and you do a CrossFit? Have you done I ha CrossFit? I have done many CrossFit workouts before. They suck, before. right? <laughs> they <laughs> and now you know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. CrossFit's stupid. No, I was going to say, <laughs> I, I actually enjoy CrossFit. I think it has a lot to offer. I don't think it's everything, uh, but I do think it has a lot to offer. There's a lot of great things in there. And then when it comes to um, like bodybuilding, you know, powerlifters and bodybuilders are always kind of going back and forth. Powerlifters are super jealous of bodybuilders because bodybuilders are jacked and tan. They look great. And they're usually pretty strong too. But powerlifters are always like, that guy ain't that strong. But they probably don't realize the guy can turn, you know, the 500 for five, six reps on a squat. He could probably turn it into 600 or 650 if he worked on, you know, stimulating his central nervous system rather than just building muscle all the time. And so I think there's a lot of great things that come from other things that were so uh, quick to shut off. So I don't know anything about veganism because I never I've never really tried it. I don't know. Like, uh, I don't know if it's something I would try. I've tried many, many styles of diet. Uh, but to cut out meat just doesn't seem like it would be anything uh, that would fit, you know, my needs. I think also, too, I, I think, you know, people people are just trying to do the best they can in this world. And they're trying to just like figure out, you know, what are some ways they can contribute? What are some ways that they can uh, feel good about them? Because if you feel good about yourself, then you can contribute. And I think people are also figuring out ways of like um, not destroying the planet and stuff like that. So some people that do uh, some people that are vegan, you know, believe that, you know, in, in uh, you know, the, the slaughtering of animals can, you know, uh, affect our our, our system, you know, affect our um, affect our climate. Affect, climate. There we go. Uh -huh. affect, our, affect our climate, which I don't know, like there's science that shows both ways. So it's like whatever, but there's some people that just don't want to harm animals. And, you know, I don't know by you saying like, I'm not going to eat meat 
and you're going to only eat vegetables. Maybe that's a different harm for animals because maybe you're eating some of their fucking food. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I know anything about veganism when I've never tried it before. Yeah. But I, I, have you ever seen a, a, a movement, a diet movement become... Uh, Super political, what, po- politicized and shrouded in mm. morality. I've never, mm. I've never heard anybody say, "I eat keto because it's moral," or yeah, right. "I eat paleo because uh, I'm a better human." Right, than right, you. right. I've never heard it be, you know, been done this way before. Right. And I know you eat all, mostly carnivore, right? You, yeah. you eat mostly meat. Yep. Um, you get any shit for that? Yeah, here and there. Um, you know, people are, people are, they always want to see your blood work. They're like, let me see your blood work. And it's like, um, cause I carry that around everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do get your blood work. Yeah. That's my point all the time is like, <laughs> show me your blood work off of your Burger King diet or whatever it is that you're, you know, normally eating. So, um, I think there's, again, I think that people are just, they're trying to do the best job that they can with the information that they have. And so somebody, somebody asking about cholesterol on a post that I make, you know, talking about meat, I think they're just, the cholesterol thing is a blockage for them to not try the diet. Yeah. No pun intended. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a reason out for them, you know, or the finances. I hear that a lot. Oh, that diet's way too expensive. And so like for a week I did like a fast food fitness challenge and I went to McDonald's every day or McDonald's or, uh, just wherever for fast food in and out burger that kind of stuff and got some patties and it wasn't you know it wasn't expensive it was uh easy to do and i lost weight doing it and it's like you know you can you can try these things and you can uh or you can sit there and bitch about them and and try to figure out reasons on why you're not giving it a shot you know what were some of the effects that you noticed for your body when you started to Redu- like how first off how was your diet before uh, different than it was after you started going carnivore because you weren't it's not like you were vegan you just ate more starches and, and, and carbohydrates from plant sources then you pretty much eliminated those right what were the differences yeah. that you noticed in, in yourself so I, i've always been a fan of uh low carb diets i wrote a book called the war on carbs and like i I firmly believe that most people should probably eat less carbohydrates. I mean, if you're already only eating 20, then you probably don't need less than that. Um, But most people will find that they can actually be, uh, they can run pretty efficiently without eating a lot of carbohydrates. And maybe that's not true for every single person, but it's true from what I've seen from the people I've worked with. Well, it's a pretty good general rule considering how sedentary we are today. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people can probably come down from 400 grams to 300 grams and probably feel better without even changing their like protein or their fat, you know? And then if you want to start to come down lower and lower, then you might have to equate for that. And you might have to change your, your, your protein and your fat calories. But I've always done like kind of a, almost like a ketogenic diet. I've been doing them since like the mid nineties. Mm. And this was when uh, Dave Palumbo was really, uh, he was really, you know, promoting those, I think. Yeah, Dave Palumbo um, was probably even more into like early 2000s. This my stuff came from like Dan Duchesne. Oh he right, wrote, you know he oh. wrote Body Opus Diet and oh, stuff yeah. like that. He's the classic, yeah. And so I got into it. You know, I got into it pretty early and always liked it, and it always worked well for me. What I discovered was, you know, through going through a ketogenic style diet and through messing around with like bodybuilding style diets, the easiest thing for me to me to do is to just not eat. (laughs) So fasting works really well. Sometimes it's a quote unquote bulletproof fast, AKA like a liquid fast, uh, where I fast for 14 or 16 hours on a day, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, depending on the day. And then I usually eat twice. And kind of how I ended up landing on the carnivore diet feeling really good for me is the two meals that I ate to try to get the most amount of nutrients in and to try to get the most amount of calories in was a carnivore diet, you know, so just eating meat like twice a day. I think there's a lot of people listening to this podcast right now that are probably heavier than they want to be and they probably want to try to make some changes and it might sound crazy to not eat, but the option to not eat is a lot better than the, than having options. When you have too many options, sometimes you don't know what to do with yourself. Now, I'd also uh, say that fasting can be dangerous and you might not want to fast every day. Like if you fast on a Monday and you're binging on Wednesday, then your fast didn't work very well. So you have to kind of, you got to learn it and you got to make sure that it's something that's manageable because we want stuff, 
We want stuff in our life to be easy. We want stuff to, in our life to be simple. And if stuff in our life is simple, then it can be repeatable. And I know that we do want to challenge. We want shit. We want to like throw down here and there and have things be hard and like fight mm -hmm. through stuff. I get that side of it too. But we're not even going to get anyone to get there if we don't keep things simple. So I feel that it's very, very simple to try some intermittent fasting. And maybe for somebody else who's never done it before, maybe they do, you know, eight or 10 hour fast. I mean, maybe it's just literally just a little bit longer than their sleep duration. Maybe they just skip breakfast or something like that. And then again, for me, um, having those two meals uh, mainly be meat, I was still able to train really hard. I was still able to get in some good workouts. And then from there, I can audible it, you know, de depending on, you know, how I feel, depending on, uh, how I look, depending on how lean I am or depending on how lean I'm not, I can, um, you know, shift into saying, okay, well, I should probably add in some potatoes. Mm -hmm. I should probably add in some fruit or I should add in, you know, a cheat day here and there, something like that. So you do throw in those foods occasionally. What are the foods that you allow into your diet for the most part? I would say that probably like, so I, other than meat, I eat uh, cheese, I eat eggs, um, I'll eat fruit here and there. I have yogurt. Uh, so sometimes some dairy, sometimes there's some heavy cream in there too. If I feel like throwing my coffee or something like that. Um, and then occasionally I just eat whatever I want. Occasionally I just, you know, go out and have a couple of drinks with my wife. Um, wine is like my other carbohydrate, I would say <laughs> alcohol. Um, the wine diet. Yeah. The, yeah. The wine diet. <laughs> I could see a few million yeah, dollars. Like <laughs> yeah. Well, I would actually be stealing it from John Cena. He's, he's the creator of the uh, wine diet, I think. Really? Yeah. <laughs> For a while there, there was the only carbohydrate source was uh, <laughs> was wine. But so I, I'll sometimes just just because I like to enjoy a glass of wine here and there. Sometimes that's my that's my carbohydrate source. And then usually with wine comes me being like, ah, fuck it, you know, and mm -hmm. I'll have like some ice cream or something like that. But then I usually try to get back, you know, back on the plan. So some people are like, how do you deal without having any fiber? How do you deal without having any sugar? And it's like, well, there's some. You know, some of it creeps in there, here and there. And I'm not afraid of vegetables. You know, like, I don't think, I don't think vegetables are making people fat. I know people talk about anti-nutrients, but I think with any anti, there's a plus to it too. Mm. Uh, everything that has a plus has a minus almost always, as far as I've seen. Um, and so like you could make a case and say, oh, I think meat, you know, has a lot of positive or a lot of negative side effects. Well, yeah, I'm sure that we probably can sit here and, and maybe agree upon a few of those, but we could also agree and say, yeah, it probably has mm -hmm. a couple positives. <laughs> Some people might say the same thing about broccoli or kale and say, oh, it's really rough on your system and it could give you gas and maybe some of the stuff that those things do and maybe some of those fibers, maybe it pulls out, um, stuff that's damaging our body. I don't know. And as far as I've seen and all the people I've communicated with, which, which is some of the best minds in the world when it comes to nutrition, they don't fucking know either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As you guys have probably found out oh, yourselves, yeah, right? No, for sure. How's, uh, how's Mind Bullet going? It's going great, man. Yeah, yeah. That talk, kratom. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. I got a little kratom in my blood right now. Do you? Some kratom and some caffeine. What's a, So how much do you normally, when you take it, uh, uh, how much do you take and then how often are you taking I it? I take right? all of it. I put it in Stupid. a blender. <laughs> no, I take, um, you know, with the... Uh, the pills that we have, um, they're 750 milligrams right. uh, per capsule. I usually take about three at a time, and I'll do that sometimes, uh, some days, you know, three times a day, and some days, none. It just kind of really depends on the day, depends on what I'm doing. Um, I do like taking it before we do like a podcast or something like that. Um, what I've what I've noticed from, from Kratom specifically is that it just puts you in a better mood, you know, and it it tends to just make everything kind of um, because you're in a better mood and because you're in less pain, it makes everything feel a little easier back to what I was saying earlier. That's the whole invention of the slingshot. Just trying to make shit a little easier. Oh, my shoulder hurts every time I bench. All right, well, let's figure out a way around that. Let's figure out a way to get some pain out of your elbow. Maybe you'll still like bench pressing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll still like doing push-ups. And so I think the same thing goes for Kratom. It just, for me, it puts me in a little bit better mood. And you guys know, like when you wake up in the morning, you hop in your car and boom, all of a sudden your favorite song is on. Your best friend that you haven't talked to in 10 years calls you. Like just for some reason, things are stacking up. It's like how much energy does that give you? Because now all of a sudden you're feeling good. And there's really nothing different about the day. It's just that like things happen to land 
just right on that particular day and you have a lot more energy. So the, I notice a huge energy surge from it as well, but I think it's just because it's putting me in a better mood. Now, where's Kratom at currently in terms of, you know, the legalities behind it and like, how do you source it? And is it like basically over the counter anywhere? Those are great questions, man. I think I'm about head to jail. The way, <laughs> oh, shit. the way some of the stuff is going here and there, you know, I, you know, I don't, it's I don't, great. It's kind of gray market right now, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's banned in some states. It's banned in some cities, even like in San Diego. You, if, you, if you're in San Diego, you can't order it off my website. Oh, wow. Hmm. It's just, um, it's kind of just in a, it's in a weird spot, but I think that people are so accepting of certain things, you know, of people are so accepting of like CBD and, um, you're seeing a lot of stuff being made out of like vaping and they're like nine people died. It's like, <laughs> I feel horrible about those nine people. However, there's lots of things that are killing people really, really rapidly. And to only have, to only have nine deaths really isn't that much when you consider how much shit kills so many other people, how many people die of a heart attack, how many people die of uh, diabetes, how many people die of uh, just taking a fucking aspirin. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. Um, I think some of these things get a bad reputation and maybe, uh, maybe it's justifiable in a sense that like maybe everyone should, um, have some caution with what they're taking, whether it be, uh, MCT oil or whether it be, uh, you know, some other type of supplement or whether it's Kratom, like maybe we should all just pump the brakes and ask ourselves like, what's this for? Um, why am I taking it? And am I going to be utilizing this for the next 10 years, five years, three years? Do I really like it that much? Is it worth it? As I said, there's going to be a positive and negative to everything, right? Mm. We take creatine and we utilize that for long periods of time. We can all agree and say, look, there's been a lot of great science behind creatine. It's, it looks like it works pretty good, but I'm sure there's a lot of negative behind it as well. So that, you know, I think everyone should be cautious with everything they put in their body. Now, Are what, there any studies like that uh, you reference constantly about Kratom that people can kind of do more research on? There's some stuff on my website where we have uh, information. There's, there's a couple of videos. It's just one of those things. It's one of those areas where, you know, you can have a hundred studies say that it's bad. You can have a hundred studies that say sure. that it's good. Um, I just try to go off of my own uh, life experiences with it. And I try to go off of uh, the data that we're gathering from, from people that are taking it. Now there is a, there's a, a, a good amount of people that are taking way too much of it. And I feel like a, a moderate dosage of it feels great. And maybe these people are becoming like addicted to it. It's what's, definitely what's a moderate possible. dose? Um, I think a moderate dose would be like around six to nine capsules a day, mm -hmm. I think would be, that sounds totally reasonable. I feel good with that. Um, now, do you caution people against taking it every day? No, no. I, I And it's, it is, it can be addictive, you know, it's, but so is caffeine. I mean, there are a lot of things that are addictive. So I don't want to sit here and try to like make excuses for Kratom. I think it's just a great product. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a, it's a product that a lot of people could utilize, um, could help with creativity, could help put them in a better mood, could help with pain management. Um, it does alter consciousness. So yeah. it's, a, it's one of those types. Now you said addictive and, and one of the, one of the definitions of addictive is that there's a withdrawal when you go off of something. Right. What are the withdrawals of going off Kratom like? I don't know because I haven't gotten off it. I've, yeah. I've been, uh, I've been utilizing wow, so straight. it. You've just been on the whole time. I've been utilizing it for probably about two years. Okay. Um, I have, uh, come off of it for like a week and stuff, but I personally never noticed anything. And maybe that's because, uh, the dosages that I was using, like maybe, maybe they weren't high enough. Yeah. You have to be, to you have to be quite a bit higher to feel, you have to be up like 12, 16 pills, uh, that are 750 for you to feel any sort of like withdrawal symptoms. And I've, I've pushed it that high before and came off and it's a similar feeling as coming off of like a, any other opiate, like Vicodin or Percocet or one of those, just a lot milder. Um, I remember when I went through my Vicodin addiction and when I came off of that, I was up to like, what, like nine pills in a day. Mm. I came off of that and that was like a fucking nightmare. I mean, yeah. cold sweats and shaking and, uh, and for like a week I felt that way with the Kratom, uh, I, the, the, but similar, right. I'll have like a runny nose. I'll feel those same symptoms that you'll get from like a, a like a Percocet or Vicodin addiction, but gone in a day. Gone in a day. So that like the first night of coming off of like that high of a dosage, 
probably feel uh, restlessness that night, uh, anxious uh, the next day a little bit. Uh, but I have found like within a day or two, it's pretty it's it's pretty much gone and it's nowhere near the same feeling that uh, I ever felt from. But it's also what they equate they equate about uh, you know eight eight or so seven hundred fifty milligram pills to like what one Vicodin would be. Mm. So in order for me, imagine how many of those kratoms I'd have to take to get the same feeling as I was getting from seven or nine Vicodin. I mean, right. you would have to be chewing the whole bottle down to get a similar type of uh, effect because it does, it works with the same receptors. Yeah. It's, it works on the opiate receptors from what I've read. What are the, what are the, what are the opponents? What are the legislators saying? Why are they trying to ban it? Is it because of the potential withdrawal off of coming, coming off or like what, what are they, how are they selling that they need to make it illegal in other words? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of the theory on it is that people are concerned that it could replace you know, it could replace pharmaceuticals because it is powerful because it does actually work. So, I mean, that's usually what you see. You see that in the supplement world too. Sometimes something works really well. Look at SARMs, you know, SARMs seemed like people were growing, seemed like people were getting a little bigger off of it. And for whatever particular reason, they, you know, they want to try to restrict that. I don't, I don't know the exact reasons why, but it appears that when anything uh, is powerful or anything works, then they're like, hold on, we should patent that. And we should try to figure out a way to make money off it. Kratom is just a plant, and I don't think they could figure out, um, maybe they can't figure out the same way to uh, patent it and make money off it the way they right. can with maybe no, Vicodin and have, stuff. Did you, did you watch his brother's documentary? No, no. You didn't I, watch it? No, I've seen a lot of... Um, is that when you really got into it, Mark? Yeah, around that time. Yeah. Was it? Did mm -hmm. you know about it before Chris did the documentary? No, no, or? I didn't know anything. My brother introduced me to it. My brother, I think, would be dead without Kratom mm. because I think he would have killed himself. Got him off of opiates? Well, got him off of opiates, but I think he would have killed himself because he'd be in too much pain every day. Oh, wow. Because coming coming off the opiates, he's still in a lot of pain. He's still in a lot of pain to this day. And uh, it just it causes a lot of problems for him. But Kratom at least blocks the pain enough to where he's able to get out of bed and able to do a lot of the things that he still loves. To what do. really sucks is that I, and I think you and I talked a little bit off air one time about this is like, you can't market it that way. Right. Right. What, but it's unfortunate because in my opinion, that's the, the, the best application of it. Because right. Coming from somebody who has uh, several family members who have been addicted to opiates, experiencing it myself I wish I knew of it when I went through that whole thing. Yeah, my oldest brother could possibly still be here if mm -hmm. we knew about Kratom. I mean, if I just had some of the knowledge that I have now in terms of nutrition, uh, there could have been a possibility there. Mm -hmm. and he was bipolar, and he was very reckless with uh, drug abuse. So uh, who knows? You know, he always kind of said that he wasn't, uh, meant to be here for very long, and yeah. so that may have been the case uh, either way. Well, I'm a, I'm always a huge proponent of personal responsibility, and I think if you want to do something to yourself, I, I think it's strange that we have laws that that will. It's like, hey, don't hurt yourself. <laughs> hey, if you try and hurt yourself, we're going to throw you in jail. What? <laughs> that makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I'm a huge proponent of of personal responsibility. I'm against laws that don't have a victim. Um, but in terms of, of Kratom, I know it's based out of, uh, like, was it Thailand or where, where, where is there? Malaysia or some shit Malaysia. Like where's Malaysia. The, the, yeah, where's, the, where's the, the tradition of Kratom use from? Because uh, I know it goes back quite a bit. And what are their, because I would be curious to see what their attitudes are towards it since they've been using it for so long. That's you know in the saying? documentary. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been utilized for, for many, many years. You guys can check out my brother's movie, uh, Leaf of Faith. I'm not a Kratom his, historian by any means. Um, I just love the I love the product, mm -hmm. and my brother and I decided to come together and and uh, start a business off of it. But I, I mean, I just like it. I like utilizing it, um, and that's stuff I've been doing, you know, since the beginning with uh, Slingshot and the other products. You know, anytime I find something that I like, I'm like, shit, maybe other people will enjoy this too, and I try to just bring it to market and bring it to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, switching gears a little. I I noticed that you're lean and jacked pretty much all the time. I'm now. trying, man. I'm trying. Is uh, I mean. You went from powerlifting and you know very intensely focusing powerlifting, on that. aka being fat, right? So then, then switching <laughs> Thanks. gears and going Thanks, to that. Buddy. But now, I mean, this is this wasn't just a one and done kind of a thing. It's not like you're getting right. up on stage to prove a point and all this. Is this something that you could see yourself doing continuously? Yeah, I'd like to stay in shape. You know, um, it feels good. I would say you know uh, the carnivore diet has allowed things to feel a little bit easier. Um, where I did a, a bodybuilding style diet, you know what a bodybuilding diet is like, where you're not really eating hardly any fat and you're uh, feeding yourself about six times a day 
and you're eating, um, you know, protein, carbs and fat, but the fat calories are really low. Um, that was just really difficult. It was difficult to like prep the meals all the time. It was a pain in the ass to like walk around with Tupperware. I don't like doing any of that. I don't meal prep. Um, I only, I only cook when I'm at like home base when I get back to my house. Um, because I get home at like four or five o'clock and I cook. And then if I still feel like eating again, I'll eat again at like seven and I cook the meals again. But the diet that I've landed on now, it just feels pretty easy to maintain this way. This, this is not a, a fight or a struggle. Mm. I would still like to be lighter, but I'm not really trying to, I'm not really trying to force that because mm. I don't want to like lose the weight just to gain it back again. And so I've been kind of consistently at 240. And I mentioned to you guys earlier, I was 240 when I was 16. So my body's just like, hey, this is a good good weight to hang out at. It looks different though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I think you look better now than totally. even when you were competing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I think you, I think you look, uh, I think you, yeah, 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 no homo. Hey, no. I just, yeah, I think you go. look, I think you look better. I think you look healthier. Yeah. I think you look fuller. Uh, I think you could see, I felt like I could see the stress on your body when you would, oh, when, you, when you went through the bodybuilding yeah. thing. No, it was hard. It was really, really difficult. And that's what I like to share with people is like, I found something for myself that feels good. That feels right. It doesn't feel complicated. Uh, it doesn't feel like a struggle, uh, deprived. I feel deprived once in a while because I'm a fat kid at heart and I love, uh, cookies and I love uh, peanut butter cups and I love ice cream and I love pizza, all the same things that most people really like. And so I think sometimes in the fitness industry, I think, you know, people might look at, at some of us and say, oh man, like they got it easy because they figured it out or they, they, they all started training when they were young. And so it must come easier to them. Well, it's still really hard, you know, and, and it, I don't know how hard it is for you guys, but it feels really hard to me in terms of, um, you know, kind of shutting off that side. It's gotten easier over a period of time. And again, the carnivore diet, because I, I think because of the fact that I get to kind of stuff myself, I think that helps. Mm. I, I kind of, I, I like to like overeat, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, I get to do that like twice a day. So I look forward to it every day. Every day I look forward to eating a steak, yeah. which might sound weird to someone. Someone's like, how could you like eating steak that much. Well, it's easy to say that when you're eating other options often, when you're eating a burrito and you're eating pizza, how many of us have had food left over in the fridge? That's a much better option for us than what we ordered. You know, we ordered Chinese food or we ordered pizza or something like that. And there's the chicken just sitting in there yeah. <laughs> all lonely by itself. It's not going to get eaten. You're not going to get around to it because you're filled yourself up with something that uh, you probably shouldn't have. So I just end up landing on something that while I'm, I'm talking about, you know, sometimes the, sometimes there's still cravings there. I will uh, follow through on those cravings, but I, I push them off. I try to say, okay, well, like, what have you done? You know, like, have you strung together four or five days? You know, if we strung together five days or 10 days, then maybe I kind of look at a certain date and be like, oh yeah, that's my uh, brother-in-law's birthday. And we're going to the 49er game that day. And maybe I should just go and eat whatever I want. You know, so it just kind of depends, yeah. but I I, ha I try to have the ability to audible and to do something different. I think you just make friends with the uncomfortable feelings of being hungry or having a craving. It's not like you don't have cravings. Yeah. You just make friends with it. It's a different experience, uh, I would say. Is there anything that you picked up that you've kept permanently in your repertoire from your uh, bodybuilding training? Because bodybuilding training and powerlifting training, there's some similarities, but there's a lot of differences. Uh, is there anything that you learned from that that you've kept now in, in your training, I guess, long term? Yeah, I, I loved in, in the bodybuilding training, um, just just trying to move through stuff quickly, trying to have quicker transitions. In powerlifting, it might take you 60 minutes or 90 minutes to like get through a, a squat a, session. Yeah, a squat <laughs> session or a deadlift session. I mean, think of somebody that squats, say, like 700 pounds or something. It might they might use 550 to 585 for some working sets and they might do five sets of it. And it's like, well, there was 15 or 20 minutes of warm up before you even touched the barbell. And then that warm up time, especially when you start to think about, you might have people in a group that's going to take a pretty long time. And then to get through your top sets, that's going to take a long time. So you could be on an exercise for about an hour. In bodybuilding, it's like, let's try to get the most out of this, not necessarily in the shortest period of time, but let's get the most out of this. Let's get everything that we can squeeze out of it and let's get out of it. 
So you might do like bent over rows and you might, as soon as you're warmed up, as soon as you feel good, you might stack on a good amount of weight, maybe try two or three more sets that way and boom, you're done. You're on to the next thing. So trying to keep a good pace in my workouts and, and trying to, once you get into like a circuit or once you get into like a super set, uh, trying to really stay true to like, you know, trying to be poignant with, with uh, just every minute on the minute type stuff. Mm. Do you, how about the pumps and stuff like that? Were those just totally different for you? I st still feel like I'm learning them. I still really? Feel like, yeah. I, the pump. I, yeah, I suck at it, really, to be honest with you. I, I'm like, um, I can get them, you know, I can get them here and there, but to, they're tricky to like sustain them and, and to hold on to them. They're, they can sometimes be a little elusive uh, for me. Well, it's hard. You've, you're low carb. That's yeah, one of the, that's yeah, one of the, that's true. That was one of the biggest differences yeah. that I noticed when that's very true. I went keto because uh, I did it right around bodybuilding time. Uh, was I, I my pumps sucked? They were nowhere near the same as when I went in with four hundred grams of carbs. Yeah. four hundred grams of carbs, half a gallon of water. I mm -hmm. fucking blown up. Looks like I had thirty pounds into my workout. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, when you're keto or carnivore. You just you don't get a lot of the carbohydrates getting shuttled in there, which also pairs and holds the water too. So just the pumps kind of suck in comparison. So yeah, it's not as good. And then, like I said, to try, to try to hold a pump for a period of time is is a little bit more difficult. And the, in my opinion, it's important to try to you know once you get the pump, it's important to try to maintain it uh, really for as as long as you can. I mean, you're not trying just to uh, totally kill yourself with it, but you you are trying to make it difficult and you're trying to. Uh, sustain that for a period of time and it starts to that was that's what I had to learn that was probably the hardest thing for me to learn was how to get a pump you know in my biceps or in my triceps or in my shoulders like I've experienced some of it before uh, but not to that level mm -hmm. and in bodybuilding it's it's really important to make the muscles grow and to make the muscles kind of look uh, 3d yeah totally uh, what about the anabolic use differences in powerlifting and bodybuilding is it just is it super similar or are there different favorite anabolics for powerlifting versus because i know in bodybuilding you don't necessarily want to hold a lot of water unless you're in the off season or whatever and for powerlifting it's like i don't care i just want to be a strong spot are there big differences in the anabolic usage in powerlifting you know many powerlifters don't really care about the estrogen buildup as much um because it makes you feel your joints feel better right? and it can yeah and it can help keep you strong too um and then also by taking an anti-estrogen you're plummeting down your uh your good cholesterol as well. And so that could be problematic because now your red blood cell count is high. Your blood is uh, sludging through your system. Your heart is working harder. Um, and you're just, you're starting to, you're starting to create some, uh, create some issues. So um, the anti-estrogens a lot of times aren't really used as much in, uh, in powerlifting. I would say. When do they, when do they use it? Just if they get like really bad side effects? And yeah. If they get like gyno, they start growing some boobs. They might, they might throw it in there. Although that there. can lower, they can, they can shorten the range of motion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah like get, bench press, getting yeah. some titties might, Bone it might be uh, beneficial. <laughs> Um, you know, yeah, there's different, there's different steroids for all kinds of different things. Um, you know, even like uh, growth hormone and even like SARMs and insulin, they all do such different things. So do, do powerlifters take those? Do they take growth hormones and insulin and stuff? Or are they mainly just the good the, ones do really <laughs> Okay, the good ones just do whatever it takes. You know, mm -hmm. they take any and everything they can to try. I mean, why not? Right. Mm -hmm. You're already injecting yourself with a bunch of other shit. So why not? double down and and uh and get a little bit bigger even though it is dangerous but it, you know the uh the prize is that you get to you know get to your goal right and it's the same prize that anyone else has whether they're natural or or are not natural the difference between bodybuilding and powerlifting i would say that most of the time in bodybuilding you're taking stuff that maybe is a little faster acting and it doesn't uh turn and convert to estrogen as much so you wouldn't look as bloated that's why like trenbolone is extremely popular because it makes you insanely strong and it helps keep you lean uh, it's not gonna like make you lean if you don't have a good diet um, but it helps uh, keep you tight helps keep you lean even while you're able to uh, lift a lot or you know be strong and testosterone is going to be something that is going to come with um, it's going to aromatize and turn into estrogen as well which can make you strong but you'll be strong and bloated mm -mm. interesting <laughs> Um, what about dose wise? Cause I know that, um, bodybuilders get a lot of flack for 
taking the most? Like, oh, they, they're on tons and tons of gear. Do powerlifters play with similar doses, or, or is it is it is it fair to say that bodybuilders are the ones that take the highest amounts? Uh, I always had a saying when it came to syringes that if it's not full, it's empty. So, <laughs> so you you just you you load it up, and it doesn't matter what sport you're playing. You load it up no matter what. I think people are going to point the finger at <laughs> I've each never other. Heard that before. Yeah, people are going to point. Well, there's no. I mean, you're already shooting yourself with shit, right? <laughs> yeah. you, you may as well. You may as well go all out. You came get, out with a new six cc. You know? <laughs> yeah, and then you're really struggling. But people are going to point fingers at each other sure. and be like, oh, they're on tons of shit. I mean, people do it with CrossFit all yeah, the time. Yeah, but you're a great person to talk to because you've, you've openly talked about that. You're all, you've power lifted and you've bodybuilded. Personally, yeah. which one did you use more in? Bodybuilding. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, Sal was trying, Sal was yeah. trying yeah, to get trying to that. Get yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, all right, thank you. More, more frequent too, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I go back and look at some of the videos and stuff and I'm like, fuck man, I'm still pretty strong, especially coming down to those like last two weeks. And I'm like, Oh yeah, well, I was sticking myself four times, you know, four times twelve or four times three is twelve, right? So twelve cc's of whatever the hell shit it was. Yeah. I, I don't ever really like. I don't. I'm not a. I don't count anything. <laughs> I, I'm really weird that way. I don't look at any numbers that we have yeah. from slingshot, and I don't. I don't count calories. I don't. I don't count grams of testosterone. I just. <laughs> I just utilize them. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, go off how I feel. Yeah. Hey, I feel pretty fucking good. We're all right. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about this? Because uh, we get a lot of questions on SARMs, and, and the way we answer it is always like, "All right, SARMs haven't been around that long. We know what testosterone does. If you're going to go that route, you might as well Oops. go testosterone." I, I mean, said SARMs, and I broke my cup. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, what are your views on? Because that's kind of new. That's newer on the scene. You know. Yeah. What are your What are your thoughts on SARMs? And, and those types of things, peptides and all that stuff. Man, I think that they're they're working for people. You know, from what I've seen, there it seems like they're working for people. It seems like they're uh, helping people add some muscle mass. It seems like they're helping people with strength. There are a bunch of things that are called SARMs that aren't always even directly SARMs because they fall into a very specific uh, category. But it seems like it seems like it's effective for. Uh, what people are trying to do and anytime anything's effective for what something you know something that someone's trying to do uh, people are going to go for it and people are going to do it so I hope that more information continues to come out because whether they're um, like whether they're like whether they're more dangerous than steroids I don't really I don't have a good understanding of well that's just it we just don't know a lot you yeah know? I'm like not I'm not sure and I guess the the reason to take them uh it seems like there's a lot of compelling reasons to take them uh, in turn because, you know, a steroid, there are steroids that you don't have to inject, but it's st with steroids. It seems like it's just more involved. It seems like you're going to be really messing with your testosterone levels a lot. It's also black market versus yeah. gray market. Yeah. Right. Right. And yeah, you don't know where to get it from. And it's like kind of, you got to, you know, meet some dude in front of a Safeway or something to get them. It's, it's a, it's a really weird thing or you can buy them on the internet. Right. And you can, that was it's way too accurate. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was very safe on a Tuesday yeah. at like six o'clock, you know, yeah. and the deli section is <laughs> ordering a sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, always you, how it goes Mark do you get a lot of people um, ask you business questions yeah here and there yep what do you think is the the number one mistake that people make that are trying to build something similar to you when you see a lot of these up and coming kids or up and coming people that are they look up or they aspire to be like you or build something like you've built what do you think are some of the most common mistakes you see made don't try to compete with me I will kill you it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big no, mistake no. <laughs> Um, man, there's, I think people need to just, uh, move slow and have, and maybe lower their expectations a little bit to try to think that you're going to like land this like multi-million dollar thing and that it's going to be this crazy thing. Um, I, I still think even if you did think that about something, let's say you had an idea for an app or you had an, an, an invention, those are all cool things, but you, you still want to kind of take it slow. And I know that everyone else is kind of a, the other, everyone else wants to kind of think the other way. The reason why I advise that is it's easy to spend other people's money. It's easy for me to come into this room, give hit you guys with a really cool concept and be like, all right, you're in for 50, you're in for 20, you're in for like whatever you guys can do. Right. And and I go and do that to a bunch of other people too. It's easy to like fundraise, you know, it's e and it's easy to like blow people's money. 
But the best thing that you can do in business is be try to be in business for yourself as much as possible and try not to go involve other people. People are always so quick to try to involve somebody else. And even like even within my own business, uh, my father in law, who is a good businessman as well, um, you know, he told me he's like, hey, don't ever forget the fact that people are hopping on this train that you started when you were 12 you know, like if they, if they've been with you for three or four years, they're like, that's really cool. That's awesome that you have people that have been with you for a while, but they weren't with you when you were 12, when you first started powerlifting, when you first started it. So in, in a sense, it's like, you know, be careful how much shit you try to share with other people. If you want someone to like, you know, be in on a business with you, maybe just, maybe you can do it on your own. Maybe you can do it like more by yourself or maybe you can just have people that are part of it but they're more like employees rather than like investors i see a lot of people making that mistake mm -hmm. they, they'll bring on a bunch of investors and you're like man you got six or eight people involved in that shit you, like it sound it's just sound it gets watered down quick and then like i don't know like what if what if your ideas change over the court like the mission and the drive and the goal changes it's cool if it changes from one or two people but if it changes for one person a lot and doesn't change for everybody else now you're kind of stuck mm -hmm. what was your first business uh first business uh was slingshot wow yeah. wow so you hit it out of the park first time yeah but how many years though in the making i mean yeah to your, yeah. To your dad's point right yeah it, it it all took it all took a long time i think probably my first introduction to like learning business was probably more through like pro wrestling than anything else. Um, pro wrestling, you're selling yourself and you have to figure out a way to, um, you got to figure out, figure out a way to like captivate people. You got to figure out a way to stand out and you got to figure out a way to stand out amongst mm -hmm. 50 or 60 people. Uh, and they all look pretty much the same like everyone's got a great body everyone's super athletic everyone's insanely aggressive everyone seems to be pretty sharp on their feet everyone seems to be pretty good on the microphone so you're like what the fuck am i gonna do to stand out in front of these animals like th this guy's six eight and this girl can do you know a backflip off the top mm -hmm. rope and this guy's got purple hair <laughs> <laughs> and wraps you know on, on, on command or whatever you're wow. like i don't even know yeah. so like I, I learned a lot through that i learned a lot of like uh almost i guess you'd say like marketing type stuff what was your uh shtick my shtick uh i was i just used my own thing that i had since the time i was a kid and that's smelly the nickname Smelly, it's Smelly always, Bill. it's always, yeah, it's always stuck with me. And so, uh, when I was wrestling, it was, I was the kid that was picked on that couldn't take it anymore type of thing. Oh, very cool. Do you remember Mark, your, the, the single best business advice anyone ever gave you? <clears throat> um, I would, I guess I'd have to say no, I don't remember. Um, I, I've, I've run into a lot of great people when it comes to business, um, I guess more like uh, life advice, you know, stuff uh, has come from my dad and that's always helped me in business as well. My dad's always said, you know, part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. Mm. And that's always really helped me because in business, it's easy to kind of like look at what someone else has and go, oh my God, that's really cool. Like we should do that. <laughs> and I was like, well, no, maybe you shouldn't because maybe you're not them. Maybe you should kind of, you know, continue, uh, continue on your own path. But yeah, we have a lot of good people that we communicate with. Um, on business. Ron Penna is somebody I look up to a lot. They recently sold uh, Quest Nutrition. I know there's several people involved in Quest Nutrition. They recently sold Quest Nutrition for like- What was a, it? A billion dollars or something. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, he was just like, you're not going to go anywhere without a good team, mm -mm. you know, and you need to have you, some good people around you. Do you remember the first time that that, uh, that advice helped that you, your dad gave you about knowing who you're not? You know, oh, it helped me more so in powerlifting than anything. I was driving myself crazy uh, with the numbers, you know, trying to be as strong as I possibly could, trying to squat 1,100 pounds and bench 900 pounds and deadlift 800 pounds. Um, I always tell people, you know, be very, very cautious, you know, in your pursuit to try to reach some of your goals um, because it can be a real pit and it can, it's, you're not going to be any happier when you get there. Uh, than you are right now. And so I think a lot of people think, oh, when I do this, this is going to happen. A huge one. That's when big. I move into that new house, this is going to happen. When I get that new car, this is going to happen. And it's like, 
no man if you're a miserable bastard you're gonna probably stay that way uh regardless of like what watch you have or what car or what house you have mm. mm -hmm. what were some of your biggest uh mistakes along the way um i've always moved pretty slow so um if there's been any mistakes maybe i've moved a little too slow in certain spots mm. um but i haven't really had anything where it was like something completely you know blew up i haven't gotten there yet <laughs> nothing's completely blown up in my face uh just yet but that's because i always test the waters you know i know it's not a sexy thing to say but i always stick my toe in the in the in the water first check the temperature of it if it feels right then i might start to get in slowly but i'm not going to like jump off the diving board uh, i just never had that mentality with really anything so i, I always want to like I always want to try something and like learn, like learn more about it. Even something as simple as uh, an Instagram post of, uh, you know, a new product being in the background or something. Like if I don't really hear anybody asking a question about it, then maybe I'm kind of like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't order as many of those as I thought. Mm -hmm. Like maybe that's not as cool of an idea as I thought. So I'm always trying to uh, proceed slowly, much like you would do in powerlifting and much like I had, I was forced to do that in school. Uh, because I felt like I wasn't smart. You know, I was put into special classes and stuff like that. And so that uh, slowness and that, um, you know, drawing things out and taking a long time, taking my time with stuff was actually something that ended up being a strength later on, especially when it came to powerlifting because I just didn't care how long a powerlifting workout took. It could take four hours or five hours. Uh, I'm just going to sit in there and, and figure it out until I get stronger. What about uh, employees or partners? I mean, you, you strike me as someone, you have, you have such a big heart. I feel like, and sometimes your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. You know, have you ran into a situation where you, you gave too much to an employee or someone that's in a partnership and it's kind of been a, a, a hassle later on or something you had to deal with in the business? Yeah, I like I, I did say, you know, you need to build a good team, but that doesn't mean you need to have a bunch of partners. Uh, the only partner in this and the only partner that I think anyone should ever have um, in, in a in a business setting, maybe not ever have because there's certain circumstances where you you just need uh, more finances to really make it work is just your significant other, you know. And so like I I haven't had stuff. Um, I've had employees that I put a lot of time into and then, um, you know, they moved on to do other things. But I don't. I don't regret any of that. I think that was all still worth it. Like they got a lot out of it. I got a lot out of it. Good learning experience to be able to move forward from. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty big believer in the fact that you, I think that people are trying to involve other people uh, when they maybe just, they probably shouldn't. What about, what are you learning with like leadership? I mean, obviously to run something your size and to have a team that you have and you're the owner, you have all these employees, um, what are you learning about yourself and leadership over this whole process? What I'm really proud of is we have a team that when when people come in, um, we try to make them feel like they're part of the team. We try to make them feel very welcome. We try to make them uh, feel like uh, family in a way. And we had Charlie Rocket. I'm sure you guys have seen him on Instagram before. Mm -hmm. We had him come in uh, just yesterday and he was like praising every, you know, he was like, man, it, really feels like family here. This is really cool. He got kind of bombarded with people when, as soon as he walked in the door. And, um, you know, that's something that I'm really proud of. And it's something that we re we try to work hard at. Like I want people, you know, we're not like, you know, trying to be like overly uh, happy or whatever, but we're trying to make people feel good. A lot of times people, I think everybody thinks that everyone's like looking for money and that everyone's looking to be like famous and stuff. But really what people want is, a fucking hug and a pat on the back and they want recognition. And so when you have someone come in and you got people saying, Oh man, I know you from Instagram. I like that post you did the other day. People are like, huh? Like you're follow, you're paying attention to me. And maybe we're just paying attention to them for that week. Cause we know that they're coming in, but it doesn't make any difference to them. It makes the person uh, feel good, you know, at the moment. And so from a, from a leadership perspective, I think it's important to try to showcase what you feel is important. You know, the the things that are, um, you know, the, the dollars and cents, those things are great. It's great to try to move the needle on those things, but we don't have a business unless we have a team, uh, you know, working, working in an effort that makes sense, having everybody on the same page uh, all the time. So it's like, we could sit here and like fight or argue or be mad about this didn't get done on time or that could have been done better. 
Um, but really in the grand scheme of things, people need to feel good in order to be able to move forward at all. Single greatest challenge as a CEO of a company. Um, and I, 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 I Is that just, fucking easy. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I really, I feel like, um, I feel like every day is just fucking awesome. Like I have a lot of fun every single day. I wake up early, I train and, um, I, I, I try to be at peace with stuff the best that I can. I try to not overthink or overcomplicate things. Um, I guess it maybe is not like quote unquote hard for me to be like a, uh, an owner because I don't, I don't think about it that way. And I don't even look at myself as an owner or a boss. Like I, I work for slingshot just the same way as everybody else does. And I, you know, I would challenge anybody that works for me, like work as hard as I'm working. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm not leaving the building, you know, I'm going to be there early every day. I'm going to work my face off. And obviously there's more reward for it because I, I own the damn thing. Right. Um, but I think that the other employees see that and they're like, fuck man, I know that he's waking up at like 4am. I know he's getting into the gym and he's getting after it. And I just saw him going to a podcast and I just saw him going to a meeting. And so it's not like I have it easy. You know, it's not like I'm calling the shots from uh, a beach house or something like that. Have you had to fire anybody? Yeah. Yeah. We've had to let people go before. Do you do that or does someone else? Um, I'm trying to think if I ever actually fought. Yeah. I, yeah. I've had to do it before myself. Yeah. It's, great (laughs) well that's tough right that's a hard thing to do yeah yeah firing people or even just telling people just how you truly feel sometimes is is difficult um you know my wife and i talk a lot about the business i talk a lot about the business to my general manager over there Smokey, and uh you know we all try to just communicate as much as possible and that way um that way things don't get too weird you know and if you do need to be released we're hoping that it's not a huge surprise to you, but we're always a little bit surprised that it is a surprise to them. Um, but it's all stuff that we agree upon. You know, we'll, we'll talk about it a lot because I don't want to just, I don't want to just have like a revolving door. You know, I don't want my business to be that way. All the people that have come to me, uh, most of the people have come to me. It's all been just very organic. They've, they've come and they trained in the gym. They saw the gym. They came to a seminar they maybe even did something for me. Andrew over there, who's uh, does our, our photos and who does our podcast as well. Um, you know, he came to a seminar, he snapped some pictures and then he was like asking, Hey, like, can I do some more stuff for you? You know, I'm a photographer and he gave me his card and boom, you know, now he's working for me. So we have a lot of situations like that where um, there hasn't been like a resume. There hasn't been uh, these probably normal procedures. I don't even know like if these guys have formal educations or uh, a prison ba- background or something. <laughs> like, I don't know, you know, I don't know what they've done or, or, or what has happened in their past, but I just know that they, they feel right, you know, at the moment. And so that's what we react to. Now we're trying to, you know, make it harder. So that way uh, we're not just like hiring our buddies off the street because that's happened before too. And then that gets to be uh, really awkward, but just like in any relationship, you know, there needs to be a lot of communication. And for some reason, we're all so hung up on, man, like, I, how this guy's going to really react if I tell him, like, that the garbage bin is full all the time, but that's his job. And you're like, I should probably just tell him. Maybe he doesn't even know, you know, and you have this fear that, like, the guy's going to think you're an asshole or whatever. And it's like, I may as well just say something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's never as bad as you think. It's yeah. usually fine. Or he could, like Adam doesn't care. Yeah. You know? Yeah. If he's an asshole. Right away says it. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't care? <laughs> no, not, not at all. I'm a direct guy. You yeah. Know? yeah. If yeah. your job's to take the trash out, you don't take the trash out, take the fucking trash out, guy. You know what I'm saying? It's that yeah. simple. Get that yeah. shit done. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. What's up? What's on the horizon for uh, for the business? I don't know, man. We got a lot of stuff coming at us from a lot of different angles and I have to, you know, sit back and try to think, uh, you know, what makes sense. See, that's know? a hard thing as a CEO. Why the fuck you not say that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, I tell you what, one of the hardest things in this business, and I tell people this all the time, is that when you get to the kind of level where you're at, there's always fucking opportunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's learning what to say no to, right? Right, right. I mean, I got to think the same thing for you. That would yeah, have been a better answer. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know. I can we start? Can we start the whole? <laughs> Start from the top, <laughs> right? Yeah. Isn't it though? Like, isn't that isn't that no, fucking that is, hard? That is the hard thing to do is try to figure out and figure out like who has good intentions and who's yeah. trying just to right, get in your kinda, pockets. Yeah, who's kind of just trying to wiggle their way in? Who knows why? You know, who knows why someone's trying to like wiggle their way in or whatever? But, um, you know, I've learned some good things over the years. You know, just even going to some seminars and things like that. And you know, one of the things I learned is they said, you know, you can't win the Kentucky Derby with a donkey. And so you have to make sure you don't have a bunch of donkeys around you. You want to make sure, <laughs> you know, the, there's the saying, you know, that eagles, you know, they only they only fly with each other when they're they're at their highest altitude. You're not going to see another bird up there. And that's what you want to have. You want to have an office full of eagles. And every once in a while, you might go somewhere or do something. And out of nowhere, you hear, eel. <laughs> and you're like, fuck, I thought we oh, went no. through it with this guy enough. <laughs> but apparently we have a donkey in the office, you know. And so sometimes... Uh, sometimes you got to go back and, and clear things out. But yeah, that is that is a really difficult thing is to figure out like what's in our best interest. In the past, it's always just been like, what's in my best interest? Like, I like these compression cuffs because they help get rid of elbow pain. I'm going to sell these. Uh, this slingshot seems kind of neat. Like, I think other people will enjoy it too. Now it's like, I need to think about wearing shit that maybe I wouldn't normally wear, you know, I got to think about because it's going to um, drive in more customers for us. It will help us uh, retain more emails. It will help us. It will help us in a lot of ways, which can help everyone in the business. And that's really the goal is to not to try to grow the business. So I can say, Oh, I'm worth a hundred million dollars or whatever, trying to grow the business. So uh, I can make more people that work for us uh, more money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what role does in your business when you look at it from the top what role does the podcast play is it more of a a way to use new media to kind of build the brand and authority or is that do you view it as like a separate business itself shit you know what we probably have to think about our podcast a little bit more than we do the podcast um gets just a huge response we have so many people that we run into and usually it's uh you know, people like, man, I watch your podcast. Um, I have people that come up to me and they tell me they, they listen to every one. I'm like, how is that even possible? Like we put out a lot of content. We do like two or three every single week, maybe even more. And each one's like over an hour. I'm like, how do you even, what a waste of time. <laughs> you're, kill, you're killing yourself over there. What are you doing? You know? Um, but yeah, we probably do need to put a little bit more business action behind the podcast. We really don't put hardly anything into it when it comes to that. We don't really truly like sit around and think about it much. Um, this, the money comes from Slingshot and Slingshot's already going. And so that's why, you know, from a CEO perspective or an owner's perspective, it seems like it's all moving along pretty seamlessly. But a lot of it's just because a lot of things have come together and a lot of things have been put into place over the last two or three years. So there was some periods of time where it got a little harder. Um, but I also like, I don't have it in my... It, I, it's not in my um it's not in my vocabulary to try to like be like oh man i was really in there grinding it out you know i'd mm -hmm. rather try to keep things more simple because it's like for the health of my brain i need to feel that everything's fucking easy oh i think that's part of your uh secret sauce right now too is that i mean you built slingshot and i think one of the things that made it really successful aside from being a, a brilliant idea is uh, the model that you built with the gym i mean you offer this this free access you're giving you're giving to all yep. these people uh, and I try and explain this a lot when I do interviews that, you know, if you if you give people so much value, it's it's not a hard sell to sell them a thirty to a seventy dollar item that may help them again, right? Because you've already provided so much value. And it seems like you've done the same thing now with the podcast. You're less worried about how am I monetizing it or making a bunch mm -hmm. of money off of it. Let's just provide a ton of value for people, and the money will come. So I actually think that's probably part of your success is that you've yeah. led that way, whether it be by accident, yeah, right. dumb luck or not. But <laughs> yeah. uh, I definitely think that's a, a big reason why you have. How do you pick the guests for your podcast or just people you're interested in or? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much just uh, people that I'm interested in and then people that I feel I can like grow from, you know, I want to have people in there that um, I really feel like I, that not just me, but my, uh, my employees can grow from as well. Like really learn, like learn stuff from like uh, having someone come in that maybe has been in the industry for 10 or 15 years. We just had John Berardi on the podcast more recently. 
And the guy sold his business for like, I don't know, a hundred million or something ridiculous, precision nutrition. Mm -hmm. Having somebody on the podcast, you know, he didn't come into the actual facility, but just what we just what we learned from him in that, you know, two hour time frame, those are things that sometimes can last a lifetime. Again, having someone like Ron Penna come in, Jay Cutler, like rubbing elbows with these people, like you have no choice. You have absolutely no choice but to be better. You got no choice but to be motivated and inspired and fired up from these people. Jay Cutler was, I don't know if you guys ever had him on your show. We're, but, we're, we're working on actually having him on. Oh yeah. man, he's Smart just, business guy, isn't he? It's going to drive you guys nuts how you know, how much you're going to how much you're going to dig the stuff that that he says, man. He's mm. super smart and really really nice guy. Do you stay just in the fitness space with your guests or do you ever venture out for people that are interesting but outside of, you know, health and fitness? Yeah, we try to get into some uh, nerds here and there, people who've like written books about like keto or something like that, but mm. they don't maybe uh, look the part or um, we've had people come on and talk about, uh, you know, mental health or heart health or, you know, kind of a, a wide variety of things. But usually it's in the fitness or health domain um, of some sort. I kind of think that I kind of think that if you don't lift, I don't really want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> I, 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 I want people. I, I get want, down with that. Yeah, I want people around that that are. I mean, at least exercising in some way. That value that. I just think yeah. that I just think that exercise it does so much for your brain. You know, a lot of people are thinking about what it does for their body, and it does stuff for your body. Well, your but, brain is part of your body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's the driver of everything, right? That's right. That's right. And so I think uh, maybe we should be thinking a little bit more about how exercise can benefit our brain, mm -hmm. and if we're trying to make big improvements to our body and the way that we look, that's more through like what we eat. Is, you know? is there something about you that, that isn't, isn't so well known that people tend to be surprised? Like, is there something that, you know, people are like, Oh wow, you're into that. Um, you're talking about like weird fetishes like, and stuff? maybe cosplay or maybe or, I don't know. Yeah. Is there no? But is there something about you that is uh, that would be surprising? Sal always likes to ask <laughs> like these dress up questions. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. we don't have to air this it's part. Like sometimes I'm a unicorn. <laughs> yeah, this is for personal use for him. Yeah, yeah I don't think there's anything. Uh, like, are you into anything? Are you are you into any hobbies or anything that's not fitness health related? That or that you just don't talk about or show on Instagram yeah. or people don't know about. No, I'm pretty much a meathead. I love <laughs> I love weights. I love talking about nutrition. I do find something that's that's pretty interesting. You know, the guy that taught a lot of people how to bench squat and deadlift is now teaching a lot of people how to lose 100 pounds. You know, I get a lot of people that hit me up and they're like, I lost 50 pounds, 80 pounds, 100 pounds. I mean, I, I get that constantly. And so mm -hmm. I find that that's kind of an interesting thing. I was teaching people to get like big and fat and as strong as possible. And then now I'm teaching a lot of people on how to lose weight. That actually feels it actually feels better to me than just the just you know here's how you brace on a squat or here's what you do when you, you know, when you when you do a bench press or something like that. Um, I've always loved cartoons. I still like cartoons a lot. So like if Bugs Bunny's on, like I'm gonna watch that shit and laugh my ass off, which I don't really like. I, I like to laugh. I like to have fun. But I don't, you know, I don't like laugh all day, and I, I try, I, I try not to spend too much time, like, uh, I don't know, just in fucking around too much, because mm -hmm. I like to kind of keep going and keep pushing. Um, so I guess that would be like kind of a one side thing. My brother in law was like cre creeped out by it one day. He was like, he was you're, like watching, dude, "You're watching, you're yeah, watching." Yeah, he thought by yourself. He thought Jake was in there with me. <laughs> He's like, I walk in the room and there you are laughing your ass off to Bugs Bunny. I'm like, Bugs Bunny's amazing. Well, the old one, especially the old yeah. one, Tom and Jerry, the old Tom and Jerry, which, oh, yeah. which super violent, super violent, yeah, offensive nowadays, but hilarious. I got some serious meat sweats going on over here from the, uh, that omelet cafe that we went to the, uh, was it called scrambled? Yeah. Oh god, yeah, you, went that, you went to that oh, shithole? No. Yeah, no. <laughs> I know. Right? We got like we got like double meat and oh, and uh, yeah, yeah I think I'm gonna blow it out. I all was day. yeah, I was pretty <laughs> pretty bummed that we they, they opened up and I was excited at first and then oh we, yeah. we tried eating yeah. there for a couple weeks and said nah, not that good. Yeah. All right, biggest insecurity. Um. Uh, wow, that's a, that's a tough one. Um. I don't know. I think I, I probably uh, worry about what people think of me maybe too much here and there. Really? You know, I probably put a little too much stock in that. I really don't give a fuck about a lot of things. Um, but when I boil things down, I think it's almost impossible to not uh, care about, you know, care about how people think of you. So like for me, it's like, I don't know, like, uh, 
some of the stuff I do is like for fun, you know, like the meathead millionaire stuff. And like some of that stuff is, is for fun. And then some people get, you know, like butt hurt about it. Some people get offended by it. Some people are thinking that I'm a certain way. And I'm just like, ah, it kind of sucks. Mm. That kind of sucks that they think I'm that way. It kind of sucks that they think that I'm all about money. I love making money and making money is awesome. And it gives you a lot of great freedoms. And it's great to be able to travel like first class everywhere. It's great to be able to uh, afford, you know, all kinds of things that, that end up being, you know, convenient, end up being uh, entertaining, they end up being a lot of fun. Um, but it's annoying when somebody kind of thinks that's like your main mission and you're like, no, man, like I've been doing all this before there was ever like a way for me to monetize it, right. you know, for, for basically decades. I was doing it before, uh, before there was social media, before I had a product to sell. I was still, you know, going to the gym and killing myself, still randomly recording stuff on YouTube for no reason since 2007, just because I thought it was cool, just because I wanted to share it with people. So sometimes I guess that would be uh, mm. something that I... I think about and something that I'm very concerned with as well is just even the whole social media thing. Like I don't want to, you know, I, I see some of my friends are depressed or have anxiety and stuff. I don't have any of that. I, I, I've only been depressed like one or two days in my entire life and didn't even know what it was because it's so foreign to me and I don't really have anxiety, but I just see that that could creep in mm -hmm. and it's like, well, what about like, I don't know what if, what if something kind of shitty happened and I was down a little bit and I had that shit going on kind of simultaneously. So right. I'm trying to figure out ways of like exiting the um, social media game, but I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Well, about a year, I don't know if it was a year or two ago, you post, you did a post and I thought, uh oh, let's see what, well, let's see what happens here. And this was right in the middle of the everybody hates Donald Trump uh, uh, period. You posted a picture of yourself in a MAGA hat. Mm hmm. And uh, I was like, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, yeah. how, how was the get blow? The popcorn how up. was the blow blowback with that? Did you get? A, did you lose followers? Was it a yeah. bunch of shit or? It was great. You know, <laughs> I, I lost and gained people, and uh, you know, I think in the end, it's it's for the better. You know, if someone's going to get that hurt over it and they leave you for it, then maybe that's someone you don't really even want. You know, listening to your information anyway. Agreed. I think that it gets to be really hard to make sense of it all. You know, you, you look at how many like followers you have and you think that having more followers is going to somehow do like more for you. Um, but it, I don't think it really does. You know, I don't think it really, no. I don't, it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not going to make you any happier, you know, where you are, your mind is as happy as you make it up to be right. Like you can be as happy or you can look at stuff as mad or pissed off or sad or happy as you'd like. And so I think that the perception is that like, oh, when I get more followers, like shit's going to be, it's like, how many more followers do you want to have? You know, some people are in the millions. They have a crazy amount of followers. It's just frustrating to me sometimes. I don't know. I just, I've been in this for a long time and I sometimes, uh, maybe it's like an arrogant side of me, but sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be compared to those motherfuckers over there. Like I want, I want my own slot, I want my own space, but then I'm like, well, I'm competing with them because I'm posting the same shit they're posting. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I should just drop the mic and fucking move move on my way. Yeah, I don't think it's so much about the number of followers, but the right kind of followers. Right. It just makes sense that you'd want people following you who kind of know who you really are. Right. Otherwise, it's, it's all bullshit. I have yeah. left social media before. I deleted it off my phone probably for a good six or eight months. And that, when felt, was that? that felt pretty good. Oh. Uh, that was probably about a year ago. Really? Something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Why'd you do that? Just, just for the exact reason I was talking about, you know, I just. Did something set it off? Did something no, happen? No, no, there wasn't like, it wasn't like an incident, but okay. I'm like foreseeing that there could be uh potential damage from it. So I'm like, I don't, it's not so much like a comment, you know, I'm not worried about like one person saying like, Hey, how come you're not as ripped as you were for the bodybuilding show, you know, or, or something like that. I'm not. That's not really the, the concern. The concern is putting too much value and putting too much self-worth in social media. Like it really, it should not matter at all. But like what person on this earth has the ability to not care what, how other people feel about them? Like if, you sure. know, the, the, the people that have committed the most heinous crimes, what do they do? They, they put them by themselves. You know, we're not designed to be like in isolation. We're not designed to uh, be by ourselves. It makes us, it makes us fucking crazy. So I think that we need a pat on the back. We sometimes need those likes. We sometimes need those comments. 
but as I'm kind of examining that, I'm like, how much a part of that do I want to feed into? Because I have a tendency, just like anybody else, to sit there and start scrolling and start looking at what other right. people are doing or what other people have or whatever. And it's just like, I just don't think, I think it's more damaging than it is healthy for me. Mm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. yep. So I need to figure out something to do with it. Agreed, man. Right. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank it's you guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Always a good time, brother. Right. Thank you. Yep.